The Travels of Ibn Battuta, translated by Samuel Lee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, go to LibriVox.org. The Travels of Ibn Battuta, Chapter 3. Upper Egypt, Bausch, Dilas, Biba, Banasa, Minyat, Ibn Kasib, Manlaz, Manfalut, Ensoyut, Ekmim, Hawa, Kana, Kaus, El Aksar, Armanat, Esna, Edfu, Ajarna, El Fil, El Atwani, Dugain, Homaitara, Aidhab, Cairo. The traveler continues I then left Cairo with the intention of going on pilgrimage by way of Upper Egypt, and then came to Der El Tin, or the Monastery of Clay. From this place I went to Bausch, then to Dilas, then to Biba, then to Banasa, then to the Minyet of Ibn Kasib, which was formerly attached to the government of Cairo. It is said that one of the caliphs of the house of Abbas was displeased with the people of Egypt, and took it into his head to place over them one of the meanest of his slaves by way of punishment, and that he might afford an example to the others. At this time Kasib was the lowest slave in the place, and his business was to get the baths warmed. He was accordingly appointed to the government with the hopes that he would sufficiently punish them by his tyranny, as it is usual with those who have not been brought up for such a station. But when Kasib was established in Egypt, his conduct was exemplary in the extreme, and for this his fame was spread far and wide. The consequence was that he was visited by the relations of the caliph and other persons attached to the court, and these he loaded with presents. On one of these occasions, the caliph missed some of his relations and, upon inquiry, found that one of them had absented himself. After a time, this man presented himself to the caliph, who interrogated him as to his absence. The man replied that he had been paying a visit to Kasib in Egypt. He then told him of the gifts he had received, which were indeed of great value. This enraged the caliph, so that he ordered the eyes of Kasib to be put out, that he should be expelled from Egypt and cast out into one of the streets of Baghdad. When the order for his apprehension arrived, it was served to him by an artifice at some distance from his palace. He had with him, however, a large ruby which he had hidden by sewing it up in his shirt during the night. His eyes were then put out, and he was thrown out in a street of Baghdad. Upon this occasion, a poet happened to pass by, who said, O Kasib, it was my intention to visit thee in Egypt in order to recite thy praises, but thy coming hither is more suitable to me. Will you then allow me to recite my poem? How, said Kasib, shall I hear it? You know what circumstances I am in. The poet replied, My only wish is that you hear it, but as to reward, may God reward you as you have others. Kasib then said, Go on with your verse. The poet proceeded, Thy bounty is like the swelling Nile, made the plains of Egypt smile. When he had got to the end of the poem, Kasib said, Open the seam. He did so, and Kasib then said, Take this ruby. The poet refused, but being adjured to do so, he complied. He then went to the street of the jewelers and offered it for sale. He was told that such a stone could belong to none other but the caliph. The account of it was accordingly carried to him, who ordered the poet to be brought into his presence. When he came there, he was interrogated on the subject, and his answer developed the whole matter. The caliph was then sorry for what he had done to Kasib in order that he should be brought before him. When he came, the caliph gave him some splendid presents and ordered that he should be given whatever he might wish. Kasib requested to have this minette given to him, which was done, and he resided there until the time of his death. After this, his descendants held it until the family became extinct. I then proceeded to the city of Manlawi, then to Manfalut, then to Esuyut, then to Ekmim, then to Hawa. Here I visited the Sheikh Sayyid Abu Muhammad Obaid Allah El Hassani, who was one of the great saints. When he asked me what my object was, I told him that it was my wish to perform the pilgrimage by way of Jeddah. He replied, You will not succeed in this upon this occasion. You had better return, therefore, for the first pilgrimage you will perform will be the plain of Syria. When I left him, I made no effort to follow his advice, but proceeded on my way until I arrived at Idhab, and I found that I could not go on. I then returned to Cairo, and after that to Syria or Damascus. And the way I took in my first pilgrimage was just as the Sharif had told me, by the plain of Syria. From Hawa, therefore, I proceeded to Kana, then to Kaus, then to the city of El-Aksar, 
then to Armanot, then to Ezna, then to Edfu, then to Ajarna el Fil, then to the village of El Atwani, in the company of a tribe of Arabs known by the name of Dugaim. Our course was through a desert in which there were no buildings for a distance of fifteen days. One of the stages at which we halted was Homaychara, the place in which the grave of El Wali Abul Hassan El Shadheli is situated. After this, we came to the city of Aithab, the inhabitants of which are the Beja, who are blacks. Among these people, the daughter never succeeds to property. At this time, two-thirds of the revenue of Aithab went to the king of the Beja, whose name was El Hadrabi. The remaining third went to the king of Egypt. The cause of Arnaut proceeding thence to Jeddah was a war that had broken out in these parts between the Beja and the Barnau. I accordingly returned with the Arabs to Kaz in Upper Egypt and descended by the Nile to Cairo where I lodged one night and then set out for Syria. This happened in the month Shaban in the year 26. Anno Hijrai 726 or Anno Domini 1326. Chapter 4 Bulbis, El Salihia, El Sawada, El Warid, Kataya, Matilab, El Arish, El Karuba, Rafaj, Gaza, El Khalil. After this, I arrived at Balbis, then at El Salahia. From this place, I entered the sands, or desert, in which are the stages El Sawada, El Warid, Kataya, Matilab, El Arish, El Karuba, and Rafaj. At each of these, there is an inn, which they call El Khan. Here the travelers put up with their beasts. Here are also watering camels, as well as shops, so that the traveler may purchase whatever he may either want for himself or his beast. I next arrived at Gaza, and from there proceeded to the city of El Khalil Ibrahim, Abraham the friend. In the mosque of this place is the holy cave, and in this are the tombs of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob with those of their wives. This cave I visited... As to the truth of these being the graves of those persons, the following is an extract made by me from the work of Ali ibn Jafar al-Razi, entitled El Musfir Likulab, on the true position of the graves of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and which rests on a tradition from Abu Huraira, who has said, It was related by the Prophet that when he was on his night journey to Jerusalem, Gabriel took him by the grave of Abraham and said, Descend and perform two prostrations, for here is the tomb of Abraham thy father. He then took him by Bethlehem and said, Perform two prostrations, for here was born thy brother Jesus. He then went on with him to El Sakrat and so on, as recorded in the tradition. In the city of El Khalil was the aged saint and imam, Borhan Odin El Jabari. Him I asked respecting the truth of the grave of Abraham being there. He answered, Every learned man I have met with has considered this as fact that these three graves are the grave of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that the three graves opposite to them are those of their wives. Nor does any one, continued he, think of the contradicting accounts so generally received from the ancients but the heretics. Chapter 5 Jerusalem, Ascalon, El Ramla, Naplus, Bawad, Elgar, El Kosair, Akka, Tyre, Sidon, Tiberias, Beirut, Tripoli, Emesa, Hama, Marat el Numan, Sarmin, Aleppo, Tisin, Antioch, Sayun, Jabala, Laodicea, Mount Lebanus, Baalbek, Damascus. I then passed on to Jerusalem, and on the road visited the tomb of Jonas, and Bethlehem, the birthplace of Jesus. But, as to the mosque of Jerusalem, it is said that there is no greater upon the face of the earth. And in sacredness, and privileges conferred, this place is the third. From Jerusalem I paid to visit to Ascalon, which was in ruins. In this place was the Meshed, famous for being the head of Hossein, before it was removed to Egypt. Without Ascalon is the Valley of the Bees, said to be that mentioned in the Quran. I next proceeded to El Ramla, then to Naplus, then to Eglon. From this place I set out for the maritime parts of Syria, passing by the route of Bawad between two mountains, and called Elgar. Here was the tomb of the guardian saint of this people, Abu Obedat Amir ibn El Jara, which I visited, and then passed by a village called El Kosair, in which was the tomb of Moad ibn Jabali, which I also visited. 
From this place I proceeded to Akka. In this is the tomb of Sali the prophet, which I visited. After this I arrived at the city of Tyre, which is a place wonderfully strong, being surrounded on three sides by the sea. Its harbor is one of those which has been much celebrated. I next visited Sidon, and from this place went to the parts of Tiberias, which it was my wish to see. The whole was, however, in ruins, but the magnitude of it was sufficient to show that it had been a large place. The place is wonderfully hot, as are also its waters. The lake is well known. Its length is six parasangs, its width three. In this town is a mosque, known by the Mosque of the Prophets, and in this is the tomb of Shoab, or Jethro, which I visited. I also visited the well of Joseph, which is famous in these parts. I next arrived at Beirut, which is on the seashore, and then set out to visit the tomb of Abu Yaqob Yosef, who is supposed to have been one of the kings of the West. It is situated in a place called Karknu, and upon it is a cell endowed by the Sultan Salah Odin ibn Ayyub. It is said that this Abu Yaqob lived by weaving mats. It is also said that he was hired to keep some orchards in Damascus for the Sultan Nur Odin the Martyr, the preceptor of Salah Odin. After he had been some time in this situation, Nur Odin happened to come into the orchard and ask of the keeper for a pomegranate. He brought several, one after another, each of which, however, had the appearance of being sour. It was said to him, Have you been all this while in the orchard and do not yet know a sweet pomegranate from a sour one? He replied, I was hired to keep the orchard, not to eat the pomegranates. By this the sultan knew who he was and sent for him accordingly, for he had had a dream in which he thought he had met Abu Yaqob and derived some advantage from him. When he was come, he believed he knew his countenance too and said, Are you not Abu Yaqob? He replied, I am. The sultan then rose and embraced him and made him sit by his side. After this, Abu Yaqob took the sultan into his house and entertained him out of his honest earnings, and with him the sultan remained some days. After this, Abu Yaqob escaped and could nowhere be found. The weather was, at this time, exceedingly cold, and Abu Yaqob had betaken himself to a village where he was honorably entertained by one of the villagers. This man had a daughter, whom he wished to dispose of in marriage, and on this account represented to Abu Yaqob the difficulty he experienced in affording him support. Upon this he was ordered to bring together all of the copper furniture he had provided for her dower, and, moreover, to borrow as much money as he could from his neighbors. The villager accordingly got together a considerable quantity of this metal. Abu Yaqob then dug a pit and put the hole into it. Upon this he made a fire which fused the metal. He then took out some elixir which he had had with him, and put it on the metal, and the hole became pure gold. When the next morning had arrived, Abu Yaqob wrote a letter to his host for Nur Odin the martyr, telling him to take out of this gold as much as he would need to make a handsome portion for the young woman. Also, to give as much as would be sufficient to her father, and to expend the remainder in pious uses. He then made his escape by night. With this gold, Nurodin built the infirmary which is at Damascus. I next arrived at Terabalus, or Tripoli, in Syria, which is a large city and may be compared with Damascus. From this place I went to the fortress of the Kurds, then to Emesa, and visited the tomb of Khalid ibn el-Walid, which is in its environs. I next arrived at the city of Hama. The epitomator, Ibn Jazi al-Kelbi, says that the following verses were composed on this place by Abu hassan ibn Said of Granada. May heaven from the seed of fair Hama divide, the breath, thought, or glance which makes her repine. Wreak its vengeance on him who would part from her side, for the smiles of the fair or the juice of the vine. But when through her streets rolls triumphant along, Rebellion's foul tide in all currents so fair. Then who shall refrain from the glass and the song, When banquet is spread and so plentiful there? Yet when the full goblet goes round, let me view. Her breasts flow with sweets for her children within. Mark the tear of the mother, and then say, Oh, how true, how vile, yet how lovely's the city of sin. The following, too, has been composed on the same place. Heroes of Hama's happier days, Yours my theme, my tribute praise. Of you the recollections sweet, Hang on my heart and still we meet. And should the forgetfulness despoil, The flower it reared with so much pain, A sinner's tear shall drench the soil, And then twill sweetly bloom again.
The Asi, Sinr or Ripple, is a river of Hama. I next went to the city of Marat el Numan, the place from which the patronomic of Abu el Allah el Mari is derived. It was named Marat el Numan because el Numam ibn Bashir, the Ansar and companion of the Prophet, lost a son there when he held the government of Amessa. Before this time, it was called Dat el Kusir, or endued with palaces. It is also said that it is so called from a mountain named Numan, which overhangs it. Without this place is the tomb of Omar ibn Abd al-Aziz, the commander of the faithful. After this I arrived at Sarmin, and then at Halib, or Aleppo. Its citadel is large and strong, and within it is a meshed, in which Abraham is said to have performed his devotions. On this place, al khalidi the poet of Saif al-Dalat ibn Hamdan, has said, Land of my heart extended wide, rich in beauty, great in pride, around whose head to brave the storm, the rolling clouds a chaplet form. Here tis the imperial fires glow, anticipate the gloom below. About thy breast in harmless blaze the lightning too forever plays, and like the unveiling beauty's glance spreads round its charms to astonish and entrance. The following lines are by Jamaluddin Ali ibn Abu Mansub. Thy milky towers in proud array stop in its course the galaxy. When see the child at thy side rise and sip the ambrosial tide. See to thy flocks the glory share and crop the gems that glitter there. I then left Aleppo for Tizin and soon after came to Antioch, before which is the river Elasi. In this place is the tomb of Habib el Najar, which I visited. After this, I arrived at the fortress of Bugras, next at that of El Kosair, then at that of El Shaghar. I next came to the city of Sayun, then to the fortress of El Kadmus, then to that of El Alikat, next to that of El Manikat, next to that of Maziaf, then to that of El Kaf. These fortresses all belong to the people called the Ismaila. They are also called the Fidawiya. No person can go amongst them except one of their own body. These people act as arrows for El Malik El Nasir, and by their means he comes at such of his enemies as are far removed from him, as in Iraq and other places. They have their various offices, and when the Sultan wishes to dispatch one of them to waylay any enemy, he bargains with him for the price of his blood. If the man succeeds and comes safely back, he gets the reward, but if he fails, it is given to his heirs. These men have poison knives, and with these they strike at the persons they are sent to kill. From the fortresses of the Fidawiya, I went to the city of Jabala, where I visited the tomb of Sheikh Awali al Sali Ibrahim ibn Adham, who had not succeeded to the kingdom from the father's, but from the mother's side. The father was originally one of the pious wandering fakirs. His story of giving up the throne is generally well known. I then proceeded to Laodicea the king of which is said to seize by violence every ship within his power. I then proceeded to the fortress of El Markab, then to the mountain of El Akra, then to Mount Libanus, which is the most fruitful mountain in the world, and on which are various fruits, fountains of water, and leafy shades. Nor is it destitute of those who have retired from the world and devoted themselves to God, numbers of which I saw. From this place I proceeded to Baalbek, and thence to Damascus in the month of Ramazan, and in the year 26. It has been said by the epitomator, Ibn Jazi al Kelbi, that the Sharf Odin Ibn Anin wrote the following lines on this place. Damascus, though the slanderer fill, worlds with thy blame I love thee still. Spot where alone the traveler meets, balmy winds in burly streets. Where tearful streamlets weave their chains, Yet joy and freedom bless the plains. Where to the gales with lusty love, Fan into bloom the fainting grove. The following was written on the same place by the eminent judge Abd el Rahim el Basani. Lightning with thy pouring rain, how dost thou befriend the plain? Why, ere the morning's dawn arise, spreadst terror through the Damascus skies? Is that thy flames may bid her glow, or gild her flowers opening blow? Or that her plains refreshed be seen, filled with fruits and clothed in green? 
Yes, tis that blessings round may spring, and verdure make the valley sing. The mosque of Damascus, termed de la Maui, is too well known to need descriptions here. Of its learned men, professors, and theologians of the sect of Hanbal, Taki Odin ibn Tamiya may be mentioned as one in great repute for his lectures, if we accept a few of his peculiarities. The people of Damascus, however, think very highly of him. In many instances, he has preached things to which the theologians have objected, and hence an information was laid against him to El Malik al Nasir, who sent for him to Egypt and there imprisoned him. When in prison, he published a commentary on the Quran in forty volumes entitled Al Bar al Muhit. After this, he was liberated, but going again to Damascus, he returned to his old practices of preaching heterodoxy. I happened one Friday to be present when he was addressing a congregation from the pulpit. And this was one of his assertions. God came down, said he, to the heaven of this world, just as I now go down. And upon this he descended one of the steps of the pulpit. A theologian of the sect of Ibn Malik happened to be present, contradicted this, for which he was beaten by the congregation. The opponent, however, lodged an information with El Malik al Nasir, who again cited the sheikh and put him in prison, where he continued till his death. He was afterwards buried at Damascus. Without the gate called El Jabiat are the tombs of Om Habiba, wife of the Prophet, and of her brother Moawiyah, of Balal, the Moazin of the Prophet, and of Awis el Karani. The grave of the last, however, is said to be in the burying ground between the city and Syria, in which there is no building. It is also said to be in Safin with that of Ali. It is said by Ibn Jazi al Kelbi, the epitomator, that the latter is the truer opinion. Ibn Battuta proceeds Without Damascus on the way of the pilgrimage, it is the Mosque of the Foot which is held in great estimation, and in which there is a stone having upon it the print of the foot of Moses. In this mosque they offer up their prayers in times of distress. I myself was present at this mosque in the year 746, or A.D. 1345. When the people were assembled for the purpose of prayer against the plague, which had ceased on that very day. The number that died daily in Damascus had been 2,000, but the whole daily number, at the time I was present, amounted to 24,000. After prayers, however, the plague entirely ceased. On the north of Damascus is the mountain of Kasayun, in which is the cave where Abraham was born. From this cave he saw the sun, moon, and stars. There is also a village in Iraq called Burz, between El Hila and Baghdad, which is said to be the birthplace of Abraham. This is the truer notion. On the farther part of the Kasayun is the Mount of Flight and Assistance, the Asylum of Jesus. End of chapters 3 through 5